Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. My father was very much of a naturalist. I traveled extensively with him. My preference of a boat is to be in the middle of nowhere. I like the outdoors. I like animals. I like to live amongst them. Martine Collette grew up surrounded by wild and exotic animals. As a child, she spent time on safaris in catching camps that trapped animals for zoos around the world. As an adult, she decided that helping animals would be her life's calling. In the 1960s, Martine was a successful Hollywood costume designer. By 1976, she had 50 animals and had purchased 160 acres in the Angeles National Forest, creating the Wildlife Way Station. I was probably the first sanctuary of this type uh, created in the United States. However, my start was in Hollywood. It was fashionable to have exotic animals as pets. And my husband was in the motion picture industry. And so I got to meet a lot of the people who had exotic animals. And pretty soon, generally sooner more than later, they had issues with having those animals. And they would call the zoo and they would say to the zoo, I would like to donate my ocelot, my monkey, my leopard, my whatever. And the zoo will say, well, no, thank you very much. We have all the ocelot, leopards, monkeys that we could use, and um, thank you very much. So what do you do then? And then the Hollywood phone lines began to ring, and then somebody will say, well, didn't so-and-so marry some gal that came from Africa? And that made me an expert in every field, right off the bat. And I took my first animals in the early 60s, and uh, they have not stopped coming into the 2018s. Since it opened, the Wildlife Way Station has rescued, rehabilitated, and given permanent sanctuary to over 76,000 wild and exotic animals. Yet Martine still recalls the sanctuary's first acquisition. Yes, it was a mountain lion. It was on exhibit at a show in this very small cage. I felt sorry for it, and I said I would buy it from you. And it wasn't until some months later that I realized that by purchasing, I was contributing to the very issue that I didn't want to see happen. And of course, we learn. Four decades later, Martinez won many awards and accolades, and Wildlife Way Station is home to more than 400 wild and exotic animals. Still, Martine considers improving the lives of the animals to be her greatest achievement. Being able to make a difference for however length of time, 
to the quality of life for the animals. Animal care is always the most important thing. Animals require everything we require, food and shelter and an opportunity to raise young and an opportunity to be able to move and an opportunity to be able to live a life for which they were designed to live a life. And being somebody's pet in a household is not necessarily giving them that. I'm not going to say a blanket statement that all pet owners are bad people. They're not. But when you look at the amount of unwanted animals that are exotic animals, you sort of have to say and ask yourself, maybe you should take a piece of the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. And I'll give you some examples. You buy a baby monkey, and it's the cutest thing in the world. I tell people, don't buy a baby monkey. Have a baby. They'll leave home sooner. You'll have less responsibility. Because while it's a baby, it's amazing. And it's all yours, and it requires you. When it grows up, it becomes a mature animal. Instincts kick in. Reproduction desires kick in. A man who owns a female macaque is fine until he brings in a girlfriend. And the girlfriend now has to compete with this macaque. The macaque doesn't understand that there is a problem. So sooner or later, it bites the girlfriend. Then it has to be quarantined or it'll be taken away by the authorities. And the man that has a choice, you choose a girlfriend or you choose the monkey. I recommend they choose the monkey. I am not against the people. I'm pro monkey. I want the monkeys to have a chance to be who they are and live a life that they're supposed to live. Martine aims to provide the animals with a habitat and lifestyle that is as close as possible to life in the wild. But where many sanctuaries are non-contact, Martine doesn't discourage human interaction. I believe captive animals should have human friends because they're never going to go out in the wild. And this is a controversial subject. Some people don't believe it. Some people do. I happen to believe it. Um, I like the animals trusting us. When I want to look in somebody's ears, I want to be able to have them come over. I want to look at their ears. I want them to open their mouth for me. I want to see the rear end. I want to be able to give them a hand injection if I need to. I want them to be comfortable enough so that we don't have to tranquilize them as many times to do some basic performances that need to be done. Those basic performances are usually carried out by the way station's resident vet, Rebecca. I feel incredibly privileged that I get to go to work every day and you know, see the tigers. If I have a bad day, I can go and visit with the lions. Um, to me, it's a privilege to get to, to work on them. Um, but it's also constantly stimulating, intellectually, Working at the way station is physically stimulating. It's a lot of climbing and hanging off of things and working outside in this environment. So it's fun and different every day. I have two favorites right now. Bolero, who's our big male lion. He's wonderful. <laughs> Although he marked me in the face not that long ago. I walked over there with my coffee cup because I go say hi to him in the morning and he was snuggling at the fence with me mooing and then he just turned around and pshh, got me in the face and the coffee and I was offended and he turned <laughs> um, Bolero and then we have an elderly hyena named Gulliver who is in uh, has chronic heart disease and um, in the wild hyenas usually only live about 10 maybe 15 years but in captivity we keep them well into their 20s sometimes into their 30s and um, we almost lost him a couple years ago and we hand fed him several times a day for months thereafter when he was not eating and um, facing death. And so I just got to where coming out and sitting there and scratching him, he's a pretty special. This place has a unique history. And I like the idea from a veterinary perspective, my mandate's very clear. We're not breeding, we're not exhibiting, we're not selling. I need to keep them healthy and give them a good quality of life while they're here. And that means I have carte blanche to do what they need 
And as a vet, that's what you want. Much of Rebecca's work needs to be carried out with the animals under a general anesthetic. After all, the wildlife way station's residents are dangerous wild animals, and incidents at sanctuaries are common. In 2013, an employee at Joe Exotic's Greater Winniewood Wildlife Park lost a hand in an incident with a tiger. In the same year, an intern was killed by a lion at a sanctuary in California. And in 2016, an employee was attacked by a crocodile in an Australian wildlife sanctuary. As you'd expect, Martine has strong feelings about exotic pets. A lot of people like to keep reptiles. And by and large, reptiles can make excellent pets. They can. There are things like ferrets, and they're very playful, and they enjoy, and they have a wonderful time. So yes, there are smaller animals that make great pets. But it can't scare the neighbors. It shouldn't be able to eat the people. It shouldn't require such care that you are being cruel to this animal. The animal has to get something from it for their own life. It's got to be good for both parties. And yes, I know there are wonderful pet owners in the world. There are. But when you look at a whole, when you look at the entire animal welfare, again, I go back to my Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. And if you cannot guarantee that every animal is going to be well and happy, and then you probably shouldn't do it. Although Martine is against keeping wild animals in captivity, she's realistic about the possible benefits of captive animals. This is a very difficult argument, and it's been, there's lots of pros and cons, and it depends who you talk to. I find that most people, unless they have seen something, smelled something, touched something, felt something, basically it's not in their world, and it doesn't mean a lot to them. I think children need to see the wonder and the magnificence of animals. They need to be able to connect to animals some way. And I know a lot of people will say, yes, but there is films and there is pictures and there is books. It's not the same. There are pictures of apples and there are pictures of trees but it's not the same as an apple and a tree. So I don't know what the future is going to bring, but for the sake of the animals, I think for people to care about something, for them to protect the animals, they need to care about the animals. And to care about the animals, they need to be able to relate to these animals, they need to be able to identify with them, they must have some connection. Otherwise, why would they care? So I think it's important that we always maintain a connection with wildlife as well as domestic life. Whether that be wild animal parks, or whether that will be zoos, or whether that will be some other arena they would yet to be developed, but I think people need that. And after 40 years in animal rescue, Martine also applies her pragmatic attitude to the future of facilities like hers. Ideally, all of us should be striving towards putting ourselves out of business, ideally. But then there is the real. And I'm not sure it's going to happen in my lifetime. Perhaps it will, but I doubt it. I would never want to see a world without animals. I would never want to see a world where children do not live amongst animals. To me, it is absolutely critically important that people learn where we come from, who we are. We are a species like any other species. We're just smarter. But our roots are in the same place with everybody else. The 
moment I met Allie, I mean, the moment I met Allie and the moment we started rolling around and hugging and playing and this and that, I knew that I don't want to be an orthopedic surgeon. I want to be whatever this is. I want to do this. Bob Ingersoll never realized his ambition of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. And Allie would turn out to be the chimp that changed his life. Allie was the older brother of a chimpanzee named Nim Chimsky. In 1973, two-week-old Nim was given to a family to be raised as a human. The story of the controversial experiment was told in the 2011 documentary, Project Nim. It was the most joyous experience of my entire life to be with chimps. And I, I knew that that unconditional kind of a, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, the, the relationship, that the space between the chimp and you is a beautiful spot if, if you do it, if you understand it, if you recognize it. And I did pretty much immediately. And, uh, and it, was, it was something that I didn't want to give up. And I'm, here I am 40 years later. I uh, became a primatologist and I have a master's degree in primatology from the University of Oklahoma under the psych department and an undergraduate degree in psychology. The experiment involving Nim and several other chimps set out to explore the concept that only humans use language. The chimps were all taught American Sign Language. The chimps involved were more than just pets. They were raised as human members of the family taking pet ownership to a different level entirely. I saw them as my friends immediately. I mean, I, I interact with Ali on the first day as if he were my, gonna be my friend forever, just like a human friend, no different. And, I, and it surprised me, because I thought it would be like a dog or a cat, or you know, it wouldn't be like it was. And I can't explain that to you. Chimps engage you in a way that you're engaging me and that I'm engaging you. The NIM project drew a lot of criticism. Much of it centered around the way head researcher Herb Terrace saw NIM and his fellow primate participants. He lived a hard life and he got bounced around a lot and he was looked at by the people of powers that be as, as the subject of a scientific experiment, as Herb Terrace says in the film. He never saw him as anything other, and this is a quote directly from him, anything other than a, the subject of a scientific experiment. I thought that was fairly arrogant of him. Scientists' understanding of chimpanzees and of animals in general at that time was still emerging. Knowing what he does today, Bob would have done some things differently. We've come a long way in the last 30 or 40 years in terms of animal behavior. We know they think, they plan, they feel, they, they have emotions that are very similar to ours in their context, uh, but you don't know what's going on in the back of my head any more than, than we know what's going on in their head, and we can't think for them. Bob was involved in previous similar projects with chimpanzees at the University of Oklahoma. Working with Washoe, who in 1966 became the first chimp to be taught to sign. I worked with Washoe and Allie and, and several other chimpanzees uh, over the course of the time I was at the University of Oklahoma. You know, I, I saw myself as a scientist and someone who was interested in finding out about chimpanzee behavior. Uh, it didn't occur to me that, that captive animals have baggage that, that really kind of transcends the, the, that ability to collect data that isn't tainted by captivity. Chimpanzees are unique in the animal kingdom. They're as intelligent as a five or six-year-old human and capable of abstract thinking and planning. This often leads humans to forget that they are still wild animals, including some of the humans involved in Project NIM. It was one of those baptism by fire. If you can do it, you are, you do it, and you're good at it. And if you can't, you're weeded out fairly quickly. I mean, lots of people worked out there briefly, 
and got bitten or, or got scared or realized it wasn't for them or chimps are stinky and they, they smell like chimp poop and, and this and that. The average chimp is five times as strong as a human. And many people have been severely injured in attacks by chimps. Although Bob and his human colleagues were somewhat naive to the dangers at the time, there was never a serious incident. No, no, Nim never, never once bit me. He occasionally came close, like rolling in rough and tumble play, you know, but I knew when to slow it down and when to go, hey, 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 Nim, Nim, hey, hey, buddy, you know, and then calm him down and, hey, you don't want to bite me, you know, and, and my method is not, because I'm obviously not a big guy, my method was, you don't want to disappoint me. And that worked for me, you know, and so I, I was one step ahead of that. You know, I don't want him to react or do something that he would not want to have done, but sometimes they just don't have the cortical control that humans do. And so in the heat of play, there might be, a, you know, a, a situation where, where he goes a little bit further than he should. So I could read that. But, but he never intentionally ever tried to bite me or attack me or any of that. No, we were, we were buddies. And, uh, and, and that's not always the case with all chimps, but Nim was a special chimp to me, and I think I was a special person to him. When the research project came to an end, the chimps, including Nim, were sold to a pharmaceutical testing laboratory. I call this the chimp wall of fame. So these are all chimp friends of mine. Uh, this is a, a painting by, or a drawing by a chimp named Moja, one of the smartest chimps I ever met in my life. These are Washoe paintings, I think. This was in uh, several museum shows, but this is uh, signed by Richard Leakey, who did this painting with Washoe. So, uh, so I've had an interesting and uh, somewhat rewarding uh, career with chimps. Uh, I, I don't know about the word rewarding, but more than at times trying and emotionally draining and, uh, and very difficult emotionally. But, and some people couldn't stay in it because it was, it was tough. It was tough to, to see this happen to your friends. Uh, but I, I don't know, I felt like I needed to do what I could. Being friends with chimpanzees, you might think Bob would be willing to take one on as a pet. Well, you know, there's literally millions of dogs and cats out there that need a home. You know, let's let's solve that problem before you go out and get a monkey. You know, we don't we don't need exotic animals necessarily. I just think that you can get almost as much from a dog or a cat as you could from any exotic animal, and you don't put baggage on that the dog or the cat. So, uh, so I'm glad things are changing. I feel very, very strongly that, uh, that the emotional side of this is, is part of what leads into a situation like that. And, uh, and like, uh, Charla Nash, for example, who was attacked by Travis the chimp. Uh, I think that, uh, that, you know, those folks are, are caught in a weird spot, you know, because they got their animals, uh, not in a malicious way or not with any bad intention. They just didn't know and, and were misled by a breeder or someone who, who gave them the animal. And, and then they found out that, oh no, that monkey loves me, but not my grandkid, you know, and that puts people in danger. I mean, capuchin monkeys, as little as they are, they can put a big hole in you. And uh, I've actually been bitten by a capuchin monkey, and I can tell you this, it was a three-legged monkey, weighed about two and a half pounds, and it was one of the worst bites I've ever had. I actually had to consult my doctor. <laughs> when the NIM study ended and the subject sold to medical testing, Bob's life path was again decided by a chimpanzee. He began to get involved with animal activism in an attempt to save his chimp friends from what he saw as a tragic fate. Legislation passed in 2015 
making it illegal to use chimps in invasive testing. And private owners, too, began looking for alternative homes for their chimpanzees. You know, nobody wants a three- or four-year-old chimp. Maybe, but a six-year-old chimp you definitely don't want. I mean, because big chimps can be dangerous. They're not as fun, you know, because most people are looking for a child replacement. You've heard it, I'm sure, a million times. It's my baby. That's a good baby. Her's a good baby. Her getting tired, isn't her? Those brothers are so crazy. Come on, Trisha. Oh. It's not your baby. That animal had a mother, a real mother, a real chimpanzee mother. And to suggest that, like in Project Nim, I mean, Stephanie Lafarge was like, he's my baby and all that sort of thing. I'm like, no, he wasn't. That was Carolyn's baby, Carolyn the chimp. And when we took that animal, you're stealing that mother's baby. How dare us, you know? And then say that we're cross-fostering or any of that kind of stuff, which is complete bullshit. Uh, and, uh, and I just don't agree with that. This is Sequoia Washoe's baby. He, uh, he's a special guy and didn't last more than a couple of months. But he's right there. Uh, and uh, he, he meant a lot to a lot of us. And unfortunately, uh, because of our arrogance, we thought that we knew better. Uh, he ended up being, you know, not, not making it. This is one of my chimp friends, and uh, they were drawing on the back of this, and then this chimp got it, chewed it all up, and they put it all back together for me. Bob and his colleagues eventually succeeded in getting Nim released from the testing lab and placed in a sanctuary. He lived alone in that sanctuary for almost a decade. That's Onan's footprint. You can see how big his foot was. Uh, that, that means a lot to me because I remember that day. I remember taking his foot, putting it on the paint, and then, come on, Onan, let's make some footprints. <laughs> you know, so uh, back when I, uh, I hadn't come to the spot where I am now, I mean, like, here's Moja holding a camera, very similar to yours. And she was a great photographer, actually. Uh, she knew how the camera worked and all that. Nim had a Polaroid, so uh, we would let him take... My idea was that we were going to let Nim take pictures of his favorite places and then place them on a map or whatever and uh, on the floor of his in enclosure. And then we would also have a book, and, and we would... You know, figure out exactly because planning and that that sort of thing in the 70s was not, you know, not something that we knew or understood much about in terms of chimps. So I thought, well, he wants to go to a certain place. Let's see if he can tell me where he wants to go in pictures and sign and all that cognitive mapping and that sort of thing. But uh, but then the then the the ethical issues started to creep in, and I started to realize that's really silly. Nim eventually lived out his life with some of his chimp companions, and he died of heart failure at the age of 26. Bob maintained contact with him whenever he was able. I feel that I uh, am a lucky guy to have had this kind of experience in my life, and that uh, not very many people get to inter interact with chimps on that level. And uh, one day, maybe 200 years from now, uh, people will look back at this and see me uh, and, and, see, and understand exactly why I did it, because maybe all these problems will be solved and chimps will be, you know, in the wild and, it, you know, still there if, if the planet exists at all in 200 years. And, and they'll look back and go, wow, that guy was one of the last people to ever get to interact with chimps on that level. Not that I'm proud of that, because if I could go back now, I would probably, if I were God, I would go back and stop importation of chimps at all into any country and all that sort of thing, but I'm not. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, when there wasn't a moratorium on breeding and that sort of thing, now we are, we're pretty aware of, you know, because captivity is the enemy. I mean, for all exotic animals. I mean, you put them out of, you take them out of the context that they should be in and put them into a cage, uh, that changes that animal profoundly.
She was crushed. It's just like she just lost her husband all over again. I think that's how she felt. I never thought it was going to happen. I always thought she was always going to be here. I never had a problem with her. It's like an empty space in your heart, you know? In 2015, not long after her husband Jim passed away, Laura Matson lost another family member, taken from her suburban Los Angeles home in a dramatic raid by authorities. Jackson, an eight-foot alligator, had lived with the Matsons in their yard of their North Hollywood home for 38 years. Jackson and Laura's story is an incredible account of a very unconventional friendship. She was a gentle animal. I mean, she never attempted anything. But when you're raised with an animal, they, um, I think they know not to be aggressive or whatever, because she never was aggressive at all. So um, when she wanted something, she let me know. She just opened up the sliding glass door and walked on in. Listening to Laura, it's easy to forget that she's talking about an alligator, a 300-pound apex predator that could easily kill her. I would take her in my bedroom at night if I could. <laughs> you know, but that would, someone told me to get a man. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Laura comes from a large family. And while she was struggling with losing her companion, Brother Ron offered unwavering support. He too had formed a strong bond with Jackson, the alligator. Oh, I loved her. Good animal. I was aware, so you got to stay aware. I mean, it's, it's an alligator. And we were just used to it. You know, coming out, getting into the pen, doing what we had to do as far as cleaning the pen and feeding the alligator it was an everyday thing for us. But while Jackson wasn't Laura's first unusual pet, Ron has never kept any exotic animals. My sister. <laughs> she got every animal. All I had to do was walk across the street. <laughs> a little dog named Herbie. <laughs> and rats. <laughs> well, that's because my husband had a boa constrictor and I had to save the rat. <laughs> and then, of course, he populated. <laughs> I had a raccoon and a quail. <laughs> So I had a beaver, <laughs> but I had to give the beaver back. But uh, and a groundhog, or one of those things underneath the ground in Thousand Oaks. Oh, he was so cute, <laughs> you know. But uh, they need special places. <laughs> so now I'm thinking uh, no. <laughs> a beaver. <laughs> Everybody's trees are missing. <laughs> And they'll be pointing at my house. <laughs> it was Laura's husband, Jim, who first brought Jackson home in 1977. Over the next four decades, the potentially deadly reptile became part of the Matson family. He loved Jackson. He looked for Jackson, just like he looked for his 50 Merc. You know, so it took him a long time to find him. He first found a caiman, which is like an alligator, but he was mean. So um, he ended up getting Jackson. This is where Jackson lived for 30, 38 years. <laughs> well, the first couple of years she lived in the house. Well, she was in the bathroom, in the, in the bathtub, and she loved the water. Uh, she would get out, and finally, when she was starting getting out more and more and more and going out to the bathroom door, that's when we decided to give her own little thing out here. So, and she loved it out here, I think. Most animal experts agree that reptiles barely recognize their owners, let alone form emotional attachments. But Jackson seems to have been an exception. I think she really missed my husband after he passed because I would see her. She she, she almost like went into depression. She, I, mean, I didn't. I thought Ronnie, something's wrong with her. You know, she's not coming out. Something's wrong. And so he'd go in there. No, she's she's okay. She growled. 
But she did, she she did, was in there for a long period of time. She didn't come out. I don't know if they sensed something, but she changed a little bit because he wasn't there every day. After Jim passed away, Laura continued to care for Jackson, although she did try unsuccessfully to rehome their immense pet. To Laura, Jackson was a placid animal who never showed any signs of aggression, not even towards her own pet cats, one of whom still lives with her. They're not predators. I'm sure if they're out in the wild and they're hungry, of course they're predators. When they're well fed, they're a beautiful animal. Laura may have thought Jackson to be a beautiful animal, but how did her neighbors feel about living so near to a dangerous predator? Everybody knew about her, so even the neighbors across the street, everybody knew about her. Everybody wanted pictures of her. Once they saw her, they were fine. No one ever went and turned me in or turned us in all those years. Jackson was not a secret. And for some reason, I didn't think she needed to be a secret. While most of Laura's neighbors felt safe enough having Jackson nearby, not everyone would be happy living next door to an alligator. Best known for her role as Mary Ann on the classic TV sitcom Gilligan's Island, Don Wells is one North Hollywood resident who wouldn't want a prehistoric predator in her neighborhood. I'd move. <laughs> I'd sell my house and move. I don't think I could talk him out of it. Remember the little ones that you used to get? Maybe you are from America, but you used to circus. You used to get little tiny alligators and you take them home. Really? It is circus, yes. Yes, little turtles and little alligators and people put them in their bathtubs. I don't know if they ever grew up. I don't know if they died because they weren't in their habitat, which is awful. But yes, you used to be able to take a little alligator home. Jackson the alligator had lived peacefully in the Matson suburban backyard for more than 30 years without incident and without being reported until a man passing the home saw Jackson and reported her presence to the authorities. Ron, recognizing the danger to his sister and her pet, confronted him. I didn't handle that part too well. You know, he did what he had to do because he thought he was saving the community. Uh, I don't know how he really ended up back here in the backyard, but he did. She got a broken heart. He must have got some type of satisfaction from it. But, uh... You know, someone I didn't even ever knew. He didn't even live in the neighborhood. He went up my driveway and he saw Jackson, and he was right on the phone immediately. I can't believe anybody could keep an alligator. You couldn't train an alligator to be a pet. If he wants to eat you, he's going to eat you. Two days later, authorities visited Laura's house, trying to confirm Jackson's presence and to make arrangements for her removal. But their first visit to Laura's home saw them leave empty-handed. The second day, I started seeing him kind of trying to come over this wall over here. Then they came up, tried to come over this wall, but I stopped both of them. They had to have a warrant can't just come on somebody's property without a warrant. How I noticed it wasn't good for us is because they had a car here, here, and on the corner. So I, like I told my sister, it's over. OK, so I already knew this was the day, which ended up not being the day. They couldn't find Jackson when they came in here. So three months later, I said, I think we should do something quickly because they go, no, they're going to come back. <laughs> the report about Jackson claimed that Laura had been feeding her feral cats, and even some neighborhood cats had gone missing. When authorities canvassed the suburb, only 11 reports of missing pets were recorded over the previous 40 years. Never aggressive, never. She was well fed, too, so there was no need for her to look for food. And plus, she was picky. She only liked chicken hot dogs. I tried to give her fish. I tried to give her other stuff. No way. She just threw it out of her mouth.
Local police and officers from Animal Control and U.S. Fish and Wildlife soon returned with a warrant required to search Laura's property to find and remove Jackson. I heard some commotion out here, and I just knew from the voices that it was something was going to happen. They weren't going to settle for anything. They were, Jackson was gone, no matter what. I knew it. I think my sister knew it, so no. <clears throat> I'm not saying we were, we broke the law, uh, but we did get attached. So uh, they did their job, we did ours. Let's, let's put it that way. It was horrible, especially when they, they um, got a warrant and they, they went through everything in my house. I'm thinking, there's no alligators in my kitchen drawer. I mean, they went through every drawer. I don't know what they were looking for because Jackson was outside. I wish I would have thought about putting her underneath the house. <laughs> you know, but I didn't think about that till later. So, but they probably wouldn't have left because this guy took a picture of her. That turned me in, so. Laura was right. This time, the authorities were not leaving without Jackson. Once I seen the warrant, I knew we had a problem. I knew my sister was in here sleeping. I knew I had to get her out because they weren't leaving. My job's to protect her. And it's just one thing led to another. And next thing we know, we got them all over the property. Right. The police officers, uh, animal control, uh, the zoo ended up coming. So. I had no rights whatsoever. They wouldn't tell me anything about her. They wouldn't let me see her. Nothing. They came back. And they finally found Jackson. And, well, we helped them put it in the truck. And off to the zoo it went. And then. We uh, set up a habitat for her. So she's doing real well now, real well, yeah. Jackson was rehomed at an alligator park in Colorado, and a GoFundMe campaign was launched to create a new habitat. We were the biggest uh, donors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But she's, she's happy, and we will get it back out there to see her. Despite taking good care of Jackson since the 70s, by not having the relevant permit, Laura was breaking California law. But as any animal lover knows, losing a pet is hard, let alone a pet that has been your constant companion for nearly 40 years. Now that they ran their law down, how it really works, OK, I understand now. But at that point, you don't think about stuff like that. Even if they would have told me afterwards, I wouldn't have cared about that law. I just kept doing what I was doing. Because you get attached, and once you get attached, it's it. I think she probably misses me. She, I'm sure she misses the chicken legs and the hot dogs. When I go to bed at night, I think of her, because that's when she would make the thumping noises. And I miss that, so. But um, I'm glad where she's at. She's in a beautiful place, so. His mum actually has put me in hospital for 24 hours where she bit me when I was feeding her and damaged uh, a tendon. And if I, if I release any pressure off him, he will know that, he'll feel it, and he will then react to that. Extremely strong, extremely strong. You can stress them out, 
um, too much, yeah. But when he's that little, he's okay. Because they're not going to attack you just because you're there. But if you land on and get too close, it's like anything, you're in their space, they're gonna let you know. But look at that, it's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay. I might put him back so he doesn't stress out too much. Australia has a reputation as having some of the most dangerous animals in the world. Gain Doyle has been bitten by almost all of them. I'm not pulling out the other all of that because then we'd have a lot more blood shots. <laughs> At over 12 feet long, the olive python is Australia's second largest snake. And although it's not venomous, it regularly preys on rock wallabies and even small crocodiles, ambushing them from under the water. These um, have got, of course, large teeth. There's, a, there's over 100 teeth in the mouth of one, on one of these. Um, very, very strong, extremely strong snake that can make you feel uncomfortable. This one here, has wrapped around my neck once and um, made me feel quite uncomfortable. Now one of the things that we do here is so that the snake knows it's going to be picked up and not being fed is we use our hat, that's why we always wear hats. He now knows, because they are intelligent, he now knows he's not getting fed. The danger is not from the snake's razor sharp teeth. It's the sheer strength, if that wrapped around your neck, it can cause you to black out without any problems. I can feel the, um, the strength around my throat at the moment. So, uh, he wants to go back to his warmth. E extremely strong snake. This particular snake, I had him out at the other end of the shed, just doing a display, and he reached up using me as a perch, and I could feel myself blacking out because he put so much pressure on my neck, it was slowing the blood circulation off to me, to my brain, and I started to feel a bit, a bit woozy. Here you go. I'm trying to shut the door back in. Cool. Gain and his father run the family business, the WA Reptile Park in Perth, Western Australia. He's grown up living alongside Australia's apex predators, venomous snakes, crocodiles, and dingoes. Not all the animals here are deadly, but the majority can do some serious damage. There are some you could keep as pets at your own risk. There are some pythons that have a few attitude problems and want to bite or wrap around. You just got to be aware of all that. But, you know, as a pet, they're pretty easy to keep. Yeah, um, I mean, Lacey there, he's really easy to keep and he's quite friendly, but there's always that chance that something can go Something can go wrong. I like him. Yeah. yeah. What have we got here, Dan? This is a lace monarch from the Eastern States. A lot of people in the Eastern States have these as pets. And um, this one here has bitten me. Got very sharp teeth, but that was only because I was feeding it. It missed the, um, it missed the, the rats that I was feeding it that day. And grabbed all five fingers on one hand. Your claws and the teeth are extremely sharp. Um, when this fella bit me, and again, it was only by accident, uh, he did do a bit of slice and dice in my fingers, but there was no, he didn't cause me any problems to go to hospital or anything like that. Yeah, I may have needed stitches, but I stayed home. I don't like going to hospital too often. <laughs> oh, this one's pretty cool. When you actually feed this fella, we, um, Give him a scratch on the back. He arcs up the back like he, like he enjoys it. Emotion, no. Personality, yes. This fella has his own little personality. And uh, yeah, look at that. He's beautiful, isn't he? Closely related to the Komodo dragon, Lacey may be a friendly monitor, but the tools he uses to prey on small mammals and birds in the wild leave their mark on his handlers too. He's just using it and he's just hanging on so the points go through. I mean, our skin's soft compared to them. So that's, yeah, you get that all the time. I, I never worry about any little scratches or anything like that. It's part of the job, you know, getting bitten or scratched or whatever, you know. It happens. 
it's not the nicest of feelings, um, you yeah, know, being bitten. Yeah, but yeah, with this type of job, it can happen if you make, yeah, you don't pay attention to what you're doing. A small scratch or even a large bite from a monitor lizard or a crocodile may not bother Gain too much, but surely a tag from one of the world's deadliest snakes would slow him down. Australia have 17 to the top 20, and this is one of them. And this is one of our, our local uh, snakes for Western Australia, which is a dugong, which is a brown, but it's our, our local one around the Perth area. This one here got me in 2016. Uh, he wasn't in this cage, he was in another cage, and I was cleaning him out. And I had the words go through my head, turn on the light. And I didn't turn the light on, I hooked him, and he grabbed me. So I don't know which end I was trying to lift, and he actually bit two fingers. And, and he envenomated me. It was about 25 minutes before I felt any effects. And then spent 30 odd hours in hospital, getting one lot of antivenine, and um, my kidney stopped working. So I, I guess now that we've got a special relationship, me and him, he's had a piece of me and I've had a piece of him. <laughs> it's just, yeah, just uh, extremely nice, nice snake. Not only does Gain still consider the snake that could have killed him to be an extremely nice snake, he takes full responsibility for the incident. He knows only too well how serious the consequences can be if you make a mistake with a deadly predator. If you get too, you know, a bit blasé or anything like that, and you take your brain off out of, out of gear, you can pay them and make a mistake. And um, every now and then you do that, and some can be fatal, or you can end up being crook. I mean, I've made two mistakes with two venomous snakes in 40 odd years, and um, yeah, it's knocked us around and all the rest of it. But my fault, not not the um, not the snake's fault, because I was choosing to do something that I shouldn't have done. While it's certainly unconventional, Gain forms rewarding bonds with animals that many would never consider having as pets. Well, I used to have my first tiger snake. You know, when when he passed away, I was I was quite upset because I used to go to um, do displays and talk to these kids and say, instead of on theory, I now had practical experience of what a snake bite felt like. This was the one that did it. And um, yeah, when he passed away, I was quite upset because we had that special relationship, that bond of, um, that was my first bite. Again, that was my fault, but you know, it was still okay. I've now, one of the people had been bitten by a venomous snake and survived. Well, this one's bitten you as well. This one has bitten me as well. But he's still a nice snake. He's still a nice snake, yep. And in a very Captain Hook moment, we meet the mother of the crocodile we saw earlier, the one that sent Gain to the hospital and could have easily taken his hand. She bit me when I was doing a feeding display um, in here with 45 kids. And it was the first chicken of the day and I normally feed around 12 o'clock, but I decided to do it later. And when I put my hand out over with the, with the tongs, we use tongs for these little fellas, had a chicken on the end of the tongue, it saw the hand and just grabbed hold of the hand. I went through all the scenarios of what should I do to get it off? And I thought if I pulled my arm up and put it on the balcony that see if she would release, but then I realized with those teeth that they, they slice, she would have done more damage. So I just hung there and just waited. Our eyes met, so we had a moment for a little bit. And then eventually um, she let go and slipped straight back into the water. I swapped hands and continued on feeding them. It severed 80% of one of my tendons and went through the knuckle. So it wasn't too bad. If it had rolled or twisted, it could, you know, could have severed the tendons or severed a few more. But I was all okay. I didn't lose any fingers or any movement. Yeah, just out of action. But does this croc remember his human prey like the crocodile nemesis remembered Captain Hook and Peter Pan? I think she does. I mean, she's had a taste of me, this one. She knows what I taste like, so yeah, she likes me. Young girl. It's my girl. Gain's experience working with Crocs means, despite their previous encounter, he's not concerned about getting too close this time. She stays there um, 
but I'm not moving any further to her. Um, she's already let me know that she doesn't want me any closer by a bit of a, a breathing and huffing at me. I feel quite safe here. She's not going to move any further um, from where she is. And again, it's, it's the colder weather. And if she was warm, she'd be straight into the pond if I was getting too close. They're not going to try and attack. I've been closer to one and actually fed one closer. Um, and it did get me when it jumped up to um, when, when feeding. It jumped up, missed it, and just caught me on the uh, hand. And I was right next to it feeding it. That, yep, that's the, the boy and the girl. They're the dingoes. Go and see them. Australia's wild dogs, dingoes, are sometimes kept as pets. But most owners will tell you that they can never be completely domesticated. This is Blondie, and she's a good girl. When we first got Blondie, she broke out of her, her, her pen. She found a very small hole, about six foot off the ground, and climbed out. But she's so blonde, she showed me where the hole was so I could fix it. In your girl. Hey? Hey? Maybe we go and see Max. Hey? Later coming, Max. Come on. Hey? He was brought to us um, to the park because the people, their situation changed. We normally don't take them on if they're uh, over 18 months old because they, um, their personalities are really set. But Max was really good. He bonded to us very easily. So I decided to take him on. I don't 100% trust him. But yeah, I can pick when he's not right. Come on. Hey. Hey. The only thing with dingoes, you can't train them. They don't come when you call, but they're highly intelligent. The dingoes are as close to pets as any of the animals here at the WA Reptile Park, but Gain remains alert when around them. They still have that killer instinct. They'll still knock off other animals. Yeah, people do have them as pets, but they just gotta be aware that they're totally different. If you really bring them up right, they, can, they are extremely nice pets, but you just gotta, you gotta treat them nicely because they don't ever forget. Having been strangled by a python and bitten by crocodiles, lizards, and deadly venomous snakes, there's still one animal here that Gain won't get close to. I never trust a wombat. Never turn your back on a wombat. They are dangerous. It's automatic, get out. Especially the males, breeding season, they change and they, they will attack. And, and they jump up and it's pretty dangerous for a bloke because they can jump up about a metre high and if you're facing a wombat and it jumps up a metre high and grabs what you don't want it to grab, it's gonna hurt. It has happened in the Eastern States. The bloke had a lot of microsurgery, but yeah, um, no. Nah. I can go and play with a croc any day. You know, some people don't want to live next to a 400 pound pot belly pig. Uh, so, in fairness, when you, when you do live in a kind of a built-up city, you know, choose the right pet. Riverside County Animal Services are an animal shelter organization and vet clinic servicing one of the largest counties in California. We cover everything from the city of Riverside, which is a large metropolitan area, all the way out to areas out in the Coachella Valley, which are just undeveloped open areas of natural desert. So we get a little bit of everything. Each year, they respond to thousands of calls from the public, picking up stray dogs, cats, and the occasional more unusual lost pet. Riverside County Animal Services, uh, we are uh, a sheltering service uh, to all the stray animals that come in. And of course, we, we handle a lot of field service work. And that's our officers out in the field uh, retrieving mostly stray dogs and stray cats and the occasional stray crazy thing, you know, whether it be uh, the occasional monkey, alligator, a Burmese python, or somebody keeping a, a deer as a pet. 
We got a call one afternoon that a woman and her two dogs had cornered an alligator in her backyard. My dispatcher gets on the radio, dispatches it to me, and I kind of made a smart aleck remark of, sure, I'll go pick up the iguana, thinking that they just saw an iguana and thought it was an alligator. I rolled up to the house, got out of my truck, see two dogs barking at something in the corner, walk over, tell the woman to grab her dogs, and sure enough, there's an alligator in her backyard. It's interesting because we get a lot of different snakes that come from like where they come into people's yards, but we have interesting calls too, where someone will call for a snake like this. I had a snake just like this, uh, Southern Pacific, that a person called us that they found this snake in their yard and they were in the middle of the city of Riverside and they conveniently had it contained in a terrarium. <laughs> and so when I GPSed the address to try to re-release the snake, I was just thinking to myself, there's no way that this snake ended up in the middle of downtown Riverside surrounded by blocks and blocks and blocks of residential housing. So they obviously went on a trip to the mountains, who knows what, took the snake out of the wild again and then probably the wife or something was like, hey, the heck no, you're not keeping that snake. And so they called, you know, animal control and said, oh, I found it in my yard, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but stuff like that happens fairly frequently. You know, well, most of the time it's a legitimate call where you can see, you know, their house is butted up against, you know, natural landscape and, and it's like, yeah, if you're going to build your home on their habitat, they're going to come into your yard. But occasionally we get these strange calls. I have personally got one call uh, where someone had a rattlesnake that they had caught um, and taken it home, stuck it in a china cabinet put duct tape across the door of the china cabinet and stuck a brick in front of it and had it in there for a week. And then they re quickly realized that they couldn't safely open the door to feed it and didn't know how to care for it. So they ended up calling for help and I ended up having to go in and uh, remove the rattlesnake out of, out of a uh, china cabinet. So that was a pretty poor, poorly thought out plan. And it's often poor planning and lack of knowledge that puts exotic pet owners and their neighbors in danger. The animal, when it ends up doing something really bad, the person always says, but he was always so calm and, and, and never showed any signs of aggression. But um, it just takes one time, right, for that person to suffer serious injuries, and in some cases, death. So it really, the onus is really on that person that owns the exotic, legally, if they have it permitted, um, to protect their, their fellow neighbors. In 2009, a 330-pound pet tiger escaped from her enclosure and was discovered in the backyard of a very surprised 79-year-old woman in Ingram, Texas. A 275-pound pet cougar escaped from his cage in a Florida backyard menagerie and killed a neighbor's dog in 2012. And in 2017, a classroom of third graders were surprised to find a four-foot-long boa constrictor inside their classroom. Officers believe the snake may have been an escaped pet from a nearby house. Well, you know, when people are having um, a pet that's a dangerous, you know, they know how to handle it, but the neighbor doesn't, or the little kid next door um, has no clue on, you know, uh, that you have a dangerous exotic pet. That, um, that's where you, you as the pet owner need to make sure, just like you know in the dog world, if you have a large dog, uh, you wanna be responsible, make sure it doesn't get out. And same thing, if you have a dangerous exotic animal, and it doesn't mean it has to be a big animal, a monkey, for example, can bite people, which we ha had happen in, in one of our cities that uh, we had to respond to. Um, uh, a monkey bit a, a, a person at a pizza place because the person thought it would be fun to have a monkey on their shoulder at a pizza place. And, and so you, you gotta draw the line sometimes with having a cool pet that's cool for you to have, but making sure your, your community members are, are protected and safe. And that would be our message to those folks is make sure that exotic is not gonna harm anyone. One of the most common exotic animal escape artists is the snake, and the Riverside team are often called to retrieve venomous reptiles 
from suburban areas. So both of these guys are from the local area that were brought in by our animal control officers, and I keep them purely for the purpose of using them for training, for rattlesnake safety and handling. So this one is, is a Western Diamondback rattlesnake, and how we came across this one was that um, there was a woman in Palm Desert who uh, who had to be put into a care facility. And when they went in to get her out of the house, um, she had this snake in an aquarium in her house. And it was a little 10 gallon aquarium. The snake was a really tiny little baby, probably just born that year. And so it was a little 10 gallon aquarium with a, um, a, an aqu a fish toy in it, like the, you would see in a fish aquarium, like a sunken ship toy. So she was trying to keep it as a pet. And, and so because we don't know the exact location of where it came from, you can't just take it and relocate it and throw it back outside. So for us, the only, uh, the only options are either, you know, you find a home for it with a research facility or um, maybe an educational institution. Otherwise, it has to be euthanized, unless we know of the natural area where it came from and we could relocate it within its home range. While Kim provides Riverside officers with venomous snake handling training, there's no way they can train for every possible animal encounter. Uh, Burmese python is a common home pet, or at least in the state of California it is. Another county officer, she got a call in the middle of the night that a 30-foot snake was going through these person's front yard. Uh, she shows up on scene, calls me in the middle of the night, wakes me up, and says, hey, Dylan, I need some assistance. I have a 30-foot snake. So I thought she was just joking with me at first, and sometimes we joke with each other and give each other prank calls and stuff like that. Uh, but I made it down there, and sure enough, there was a large snake under these people's, uh, I believe it was a eucalyptus bush that was going alongside the, uh, the fence line. All I did was grab it with a, a catch pole, got that around its head, the, the snake obviously coiled up around the pole, and then we just carried it to the truck like a, like a rotisserie rack. One person on one side, one person on the other side, and we put it in the truck like that, we let go of the loop, and it hung out in the truck for the way back. You know, a lot of the, the training for some of these exotics kind of happens like that moment in time. Uh, you don't really respond to a domesticated deer call every day. When it comes to like a Burmese python, it's, you know, the officers, they're really good with their control stick, their, or the catch pole as it's known. Some of these are uh, just really kind of bizarre calls that they just have to use their instincts. Bear in mind, the officers are dealing with some of the most vicious dogs that you might see um, walking the street. Some of them are, are bully breed dogs. Some of them are very aggressive. And these officers don't scare easily. In fact, I think the Burmese python scared that one officer more so than, than a, a large pit bull coming at her. Uh, those are just such weird, odd calls and you don't really know how to handle the Burmese python and you don't want to get choked to death. So those, those types of calls are sort of like, you know, you learn as you go sometimes. Every call out comes with a risk and Riverside officers can just never be sure what they'll encounter when they arrive at a scene. At the time of it, it's a little hectic and scary just because you don't know if it's fully domesticated. A lot of people, they have these quote unquote wild animals for pets and never socialize them properly. So sometimes they will bite or do other things that aren't foreseen. Much of what Riverside County Animal Services does also involves educating the public about choosing the right pet and then providing that pet with the appropriate care. Those folks that like, for example, to have a Burmese python, sometimes they get them when they're young and then they're not really fully educating themselves on, on just how large those snakes can get. And it's not the easiest pet to care for once it's an adult pet. I mean, they get 20 to 30, you know, they get very long and very wide. And when you go out of town and you ask your buddy to, you know, feed your pet, uh, make sure the buddy knows how, how to close the, the tank of the Burmese python securely because 
that's when you get into problems where, you know, the next door neighbor finds out that you have a 20 foot Burmese python. Educating the general public on exotics is important because some people um, like to have interesting pets. And then when it comes to animals like a tegu lizard, uh, quite an amazing uh, critter, but um, they can get big too. And your neighbor may not want to see that tegu lizard knocking on their front door. So, you know, it's really making sure that your that exotic pet is going to stay in your property and not wander off because that can really scare the heck out of somebody if they are finding out that you own that tegu lizard and they didn't know that. Another one I had a, a tegu running down Wood Road. Somebody called for a large lizard in the road, so I arrived on scene. And sure enough, there was uh, the body was probably only about two feet long, but the tails were tails about three feet long and. Their tail is stronger than heck, so they can whip you and cut you open with that. It's kind of like keeping a, you know, some of the more uh, aggressive dog breeds. Uh, you know, it, if you've got a responsible owner that knows what they're doing, you can keep some of those safely. Um, and then there's some things that you just shouldn't have. You know, when we walk into a house and somebody's caught a rattlesnake from out in the desert and it's in an aquarium, it's a venomous snake. Nobody should be keeping those as pets. Um, boa constrictor, you know, there are responsible people out there that can keep them as a pet, but it's not a pet for everybody. Most people probably don't have the skills, the ability, the finances, just the space to keep something that can potentially get as large as those are going to get. We're in the business of promoting um, responsible pet ownership, whether you own a dog, a cat, or a rabbit, or a horse, um, a tortoise. We always want people to love that animal uh, and make it part of your family. We don't really um, have any strong opinion one way or the other when it comes to exotic pets. We just don't like when somebody uh, no longer is interested in being the pet owner of said exotic pet and then they just re release it into the wild and uh, scaring their neighbors or also uh, shamefully allowing that animal to suffer because uh, it could get hit by a car just like a dog or a cat or it goes off into the wild and gets killed by other critters but but it's shameful when the pet loses its charm and then they they think oh I'll just dump it in the riverbed or um, you know I'll just release it if you have an exotic pet know how long that pet will be in your life a tortoise for example can live 70 80 90 100 years so you might want to put the tortoise in your will and know that your son is going to be caring for the next 50 years of that tortoise's life. That's the only thing we'd like to share with people that are interested in exotic pets is know it's a part of your family. And, and when it loses its charm, don't forget, you're still the pet parent. The officers at Riverside County Animal Services have dealt with everything from escaped emus to roaming reptiles. And when it comes to exotic animals, they've seen firsthand that too little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. I think that, at least here in California, for the most part, with stuff that could kill a human being, I think that those who have them that do it legally are able, you know, okay. But they have to reach such a bar, that's such a high bar for them to get to those proper permits and stuff. It's a, you know, I'm kind of okay with those people. It's the backyard person who doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't have that training and hasn't gone through all the permitting process and the inspection process to try and keep a lion or a tiger or you know, you know, something else along those lines that it's, it's a recipe for disaster. You can go to any zoo, any private place in the United States or around the world, and as soon as there's a fence, you don't have to treat them like a tiger. They're not predators anymore, they're just beautiful, interesting and here for our enjoyment. From the fashionable Victorian menagerie to the animal stunts we see in modern movies, exotic animals have long performed for our enjoyment and entertainment. But what happens to the animals when they can no longer perform? Many end up at sanctuaries like the Performing Animal Welfare Society a 2,300-acre natural habitat wildlife sanctuary located near San Andreas, California. 
This unique facility is currently home to nine elephants, four lions, one black leopard, seven bears, 22 tigers, and co-founder and president, Ed Stewart. This is Kim, and she's in there with Roy and Claire. She's 15 years old, came out of a roadside zoo in New Hampshire, and was scheduled to go to the pet industry. Somebody intercepted her and brought her to us when they were just cubs. Hi. Hi. Hi, <laughs> I know. You're a wonderful girl. Yeah, you're good. PAWS provides homes for retired or mistreated animal entertainers and investigates reports of abused performing and exotic animals. Unsurprisingly, Ed has strong feelings about exotic animal ownership of any kind. I know that there are some good facilities and some are good, some are bad, but the ultimate goal for all of these places is a little murky to me. Is it to return animals to the wild? Is it to teach people about animals? I think all of it is ineffective. In the history of the world, nobody has taken a captive tiger and put it into the wild. And with the shrinking habitat, it's never gonna happen. So reintroduction is a pipe dream. It's, it's not gonna happen. And while some may argue that captivity is a valid way of preserving a species or educating the public about conservation, others, like Ed, believe that captivity changes an animal to the extent that it is no longer anything like its ancestors. Our mission is to give the animals that we take the best life we can give them, knowing that we can't give them a normal life. We can't give her a natural life. She's 15 years old and she has never had to catch her dinner, never had to hunt for her food. We have provided everything. You put an animal in an enclosure, whether it's a big enclosure or a small enclosure, you have totally changed their life. She's an apex predator. She would hunt almost constantly looking for enough food. She would be raising babies, she would have an incredible responsibility in the wild and she would rely only on herself. Their natural history is so ingrained in them to perform their duties and you take all that away in captivity. As soon as you put a fence up, you create disrespect for that animal. It's something of a contradiction for Ed. On one hand, he's against keeping wild animals in captivity. On the other, he keeps captive animals. We're honestly looking at these animals every day. We really want to do the best we can for them. But the best thing you can do for them is not promote it in captivity, because they're just not designed to live captive. And it's, it's a black and white issue. So we don't look at her or him like a tiger. We look at him as an individual. They're so far removed from a real tiger in the wild we know we have to do absolutely the best we can for them and give them the nicest place we can to, to live and, and the best vet care. But if, I, if we had a breeding pair, I would, I would be heart sick if I was the one responsible for creating a litter of baby tigers that would have to live their whole life in a cage. You know, it's just basic freedom for a tiger to be wild. PAWS Director of Veterinary Services, Dr. Jackie Guy, has the job of ensuring that all the animals are kept healthy. Many of the problems she sees are a direct result of captivity. Animals in captivity, especially wild animals in captivity, can develop all sorts of problems that are unique to captivity that aren't found in wild populations. So as a captive wildlife veterinarian, I would say Probably 95% of the problems that I'm seeing in my patients are related to captivity in one way or another. An example of that is, um, this is a tiger. These are um, radiographs or x-rays of a tiger's spine who is, he's an adult. He's not an old man by any means, but he's a mature adult. And he's got significant, significant arthritis um, that, you know, would not be seen in a wild tiger. This is an early onset of really, really severe arthritis. 
And the problems Dr. Jackie sees associated with captivity are not just physical health issues. Confinement is very hard on animals, regardless of the size of the cage. Um, being confined brings with it all sorts of um, challenges for especially formerly wild animals or wild animals. Wild animals are not domesticated. In other words, they're not used to being held captive. And so there are instincts that they have that are, um, they're not able to express and that leads to frustration. It leads to a lot of behavioral problems, a lot of anxiety and stress, um, which sometimes they'll end up pacing or tossing their heads or doing various repetitive behaviors. And we've all seen that. We've all seen a pacing bear in a cage or a tiger in a cage. That's abnormal. They don't do that in the wild. Also, a really sad thing is when an exotic animal begins to self-mutilate or damage itself, pull its hair out or pull its feathers out, um, and that's, that's an unfortunate consequence of stress, of being in captivity. Winston, one of the sanctuary's current bear residents, has only recently stopped displaying those telltale signs of captive boredom. Captivity, it's a challenge. When you look at California mountains, that's where they should live. The Smoky Mountains, Florida, they're all over uh, the United States. And when they're in captivity, a lot of times, they're one of the worst pacers, one of the worst at rocking their heads. They, they just don't have anything to do. As former pets or performers, the animals here are accustomed to being around humans and many involved in the exotic animal ownership debate believe that they should continue to enjoy human companionship. Hey, girls. Mara, let go. Come on, girl, let go. Come on, Tika. What a good girl. What a good girl. Mara, let go. Come on, young lady. Thanks, girl. I see. Oh, 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 oh. oh boy. Oh boy. See their teeth are they're made for eating. You can see it in there. They're made for eating branches and hard brush and eating a very low protein, high fiber diet. We don't ever teach them tricks just to teach them a trick, but in order to check their teeth, it's good to be able to handle them a little bit. We don't go inside with them, but we do it from the outside. Elephants are actually, can be really, really excellent patients. They're very intelligent. They enjoy interacting with us and we use positive reinforcement training with our elephants, meaning they choose to participate in their own health care, and they're rewarded for that. They're never punished. And so, consequently, it's actually quite easy for me to provide veterinary care for such an intelligent species. They're very easy to work with. They voluntarily will allow me to draw blood, take x-rays, uh, work on their feet. Even more invasive things like collecting a small biopsy, things like that, they have learned um, that you know we're not here to punish or harm them in any way, so they're actually really good patients. But not all of Dr. Guy's patients are as cooperative as the elephants. It can definitely be dangerous being around dangerous exotic animals, dangerous wild animals in captivity or free ranging for anybody, including um, an owner of an animal, but certainly for the veterinarian. And so again, it, it takes somebody like myself who's had specialized training to know how to safely treat these animals, but there's always a potential for, you know, somebody to get hurt. And although Ed feels that captive exotics are no longer the predators they would be in the wild, even he has no doubt they remain potentially deadly. Predators know that they're predators. They don't know why, maybe, that they're focused on vulnerable things, but they do. Somebody with crutches, somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who's lagging behind, they know even though they don't have to 
it's just part of their nature to stalk and maybe hunt. And while many owners of exotic pets do provide for all their needs, caring for such unusual animals proves too difficult for many, and they often arrive at sanctuaries with a host of health issues. We have right now the second oldest African elephant in the country uh, living here. It's almost like a retirement home in some ways, especially for elephants. You know they're getting old. You know they have arthritis before they get here. Sometimes they have foot problems, toe problems, infections or bone problems. And so you just want to give them as many good years as you can. We, in a sanctuary situation, you rarely see, you know, young, healthy animals in need of placement. They are oftentimes the product of almost what I would call a puppy mill for tigers, where they're just breeding and breeding and breeding, sometimes for photo shoots and things like that, with no regard for what happens to them after that function is complete, when the tiger is too big to handle or too big to use in uh, public contact or films, a lot of times they're viewed as disposable and most of them are unhealthy. They'll come to us with all sorts of issues, uh, vision problems, um, crooked legs, arthritis, um, early kidney disease is very common. Um, and some of those conditions are um, genetic. They're congenital um, problems that are passed on from generation to generation. For many animal advocates, freedom is the ultimate goal. But once an animal is already in captivity, options are limited. We do what we can, but we can't give them what, what they should have, and that's their total freedom. Nothing would make us happier than to release these guys to where they should be. But the fact is, they would not be able to do it. They wouldn't have a herd. They wouldn't know what to do. And they'd probably die within a few weeks or less. Okay, we gotta go. We gotta go, you can't eat this whole bucket. Our happiest times are when we see them up on the hill like this, grazing on fresh green grass. When you have a sanctuary, you live for moments where the animals are doing something that they would be doing in the wild. So if they're in a mud hole, if they're grazing, if they're pushing on a tree, if they're tearing branches off, those are all kind of rewarding times for us. But. It's, it's not a substitute uh, for the wild. While Ed may be able to provide the illusion of freedom to the animals in his care, he's very aware that true freedom is something they'll never know. If any of these animals could go free, if all of them could go free, we would load them up tomorrow and take them, take them home, take them back and let them go. And I think it's a responsibility for us to tell people the truth about captivity, at least our point of view. And if we don't win the argument, that's okay. We're not gonna beat anybody over the head, but I think if you take a step back and look at captivity, it's, it hasn't worked. It's bad for individuals. It's not helping species. So it's time to change the model. Go to the woods, go to the creek, turn over some rocks, look at the animals, teach your children respect for nature, just basic respect for nature. I think that's the starting point. And if we can't turn it around, we can't turn it around, but let's not make tigers and bears and elephants live in enclosures for the rest of their life, generation after generation after generation, for really no reason. Birds of prey are instantly recognized as predators. Yeah, this is all legal. They are built to hunt and are some of the fastest animals on Earth. One man in Utah, USA, is closer to these birds than most of us are ever likely to be. Martin Tyner is not only a recognized expert on birds of prey, he also shares his life and his home with some unusual bird friends. Uh, this is a prairie falcon, her name is Cirrus. She is uh, one of our desert falcons here in, in North America. She does live in the house, 
Basically, the reason she lives in the house is, is these animals are very wild, very high strung, very difficult to deal with, and they require um, a lot of socialization, a lot of interaction with people uh, in order to be uh, comfortable, especially when I'm out doing wildlife programs in an audience of 500 to 1,000 people. The birds have to be comfortable. And so she, she comes in, she goes out in the daytime, but she comes in the house and hangs out and watches TV with the family. And she's just truly a member of the family. She's very sweet. She loves to talk to me. Martin is a master falconer and an educator, and he is heavily involved with the conservation of birds of prey. But he is very aware of the dangers of keeping these large birds, and he never forgets where they have come from. Uh, this is this is in every respect. This is a wild animal. Even though, even though you know she's worked with me and and we get along wonderfully together, she still is wild. She still has a very strong fight or flight instinct. She still has. She's still instinctively afraid of humans. And so, but you know, being again in the house in her location, strangers and cameras and things. That's 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 pretty tough on her. Uh, and so the hood is actually her protection against stress. Um, it just covers her eyes, so now she can kind of just sit quietly and, and she doesn't feel frightened. Putting a small leather hood over the head of the bird instantly quietens them down and gives the bird a sense of security. Martin is an expert on the handling of birds, so taking his feather friend back to her pen is a simple procedure. Having a bird of prey as a pet might be a different story altogether. It actually isn't quite like a dog or cat in, in that with a dog or cat, uh, they have been um, domesticated. They want to be with you. They want to be your friend. Uh, when it comes to apex predators like this falcon and my eagle and my hawk that I fly, these animals don't necessarily like you. They don't necessarily want to be with you. They don't necessarily uh, respect you in any way, shape, fashion, or form. But what they do is they exploit you. So the truth of the matter is she's the hunter, I'm her dog. You know, falconry is one of very, very few relationships between man and wildlife that's mutually beneficial. Uh, we don't own these birds in any way, shape, fashion, or form. We serve them well. And that's the only reason they come back. Many of the birds here are rescues or long-term patients needing rehabilitation. But some have been bred in captivity. This is about as high strung and difficult as you can deal with. And I've loved the challenge. She's really an amazing animal to work with. In no way is she a pet. She's strictly an apex predator, and, and you have to love that, but you never consider this a pet. You, she'll hurt you. There's my little BG. And as, as you can see, her posture is very, very different, even though I raised her. And this is, the, this is probably one of the most important things I can show people, is even though I've raised her, and even though she is as captive a bird of prey as you'll ever find, high bred hawk, every ounce of wild instinct is there. She acts very, very much like the wildest birds of prey that you'll ever see. And this particular bird, as long as we're hunting, she, she's, sheer, she's a joy. But if I'm not serving her well, then, then she's a bit of a brat. The body language that she's saying here is that I will allow you to come hunting with me, but damn it, don't touch me. She is absolutely in charge. Now, uh, again, on the head, I can touch her breast slowly, but even that, hey, sweetie. Yes. But I have to watch those feet because that's what she kills with. Those razor sharp talons is what she uses to kill with. And so she can bite, but the bite really isn't nearly as, as bad as, as the feet. Hi, oh, baby. Yes, you're such a brat. But you're a goshawk, that's why, huh? There is no doubt that Martin loves his birds. But one of them is his favorite. Scout is an American golden eagle and has been with Martin for over 15 years. Their relationship is unique and crosses the borders between pet ownership and a mutual respect between animal and human. It's OK. 
bounce, 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 bounce. Oh, it's alright. Come on, your guys will get busy a little bit. Oh boy. Come here. It's okay. I know, you gotta settle down. Here we go. I know. Come on, settle yeah, in. So, That's my boy. So this is an American Golden Eagle? Yeah, this is the Golden Eagle. They are protected under the Federal Eagle Act, which is actually protection above the Endangered Species Act. And so the Golden and the Bald Eagle, Scout, I know, they're okay. I know, you said, I don't know what that stuff is and I don't like it. It's okay. It's my boy. It's my boy. It's okay. I know. Strangers in your house. This is the Golden Eagle. The farmer up in Wyoming was threatening to shoot him and I was called in by the federal government to rescue him before he got shot. So this is, a, in every respect, a full-grown wild eagle. Shall we start from the bottom work our way up, big guy? And you look at these feet, you know, 600 pounds per square inch of crushing power in those feet. He could drive those talons through my glove and crush the bones in my hand. So it's really good he likes me. We appreciate that. These large chest muscles are the motors that he uses to drive that beautiful six foot wingspan. That beautiful six foot wingspan that allows eagles to fly where hawks and falcons cannot. Eagles have been spotted at altitudes greater than 30,000 feet. Their strong eyesight is what enables them to be such precise and accurate hunters. My eagle can see eight times further than you can. And not only does he see eight times further, he has six times the number of light sensitive cells, the rods and cones on the back of the eye. So everything he sees is six times clearer. This eagle can spot a jackrabbit five miles away. And he does. We go out on the desert just north of town here. He flies free. He goes thousands of feet in the sky, he flies with the wild eagles, and he follows me as I flush out jackrabbits for him to catch. And so he flies like an eagle and hunts like an eagle. And, uh, and then if we don't catch any rabbits, he knows he can fly back, land on my glove, I'll feed him anyway. One day he got a little confused. Thousands of feet in the sky, no rabbits to be found, it was time to go home. So I blew my whistle, threw his toy out on the ground, and my eagle went into a wonderful dive headlong, vertical, about 145 miles an hour. It was impressive, but it became apparent very quickly he wasn't going for his toy. He was coming for my arm. When I woke up, I was six feet back, laying face down in the dirt with my eagle standing next to me, looking down at me to say, why are you laying there? I had a long talk with my eagle that day, how I could not withstand the impact of an eight pound bird at 145 miles an hour, and I would appreciate if you'd never do that again. He dislocated my shoulder and damaged my back and knees. Looking after eagles does have its challenges. They are, after all, a major predator and can leave a nasty bite. He's the hunter, I'm his dog, and, uh, and he and I have been together now for 15 years. And so he's kept me for 15 years, so that's, that's wonderful. This is truly an honor, to be able to have literally your best friend as a wild golden eagle, and wild in, in every sense of the word, and, and to have the privilege of that wild animal coming right out of the sky, coming back to me, landing on my glove, and uh, being able to, to understand him is, is something that's, uh, that's almost beyond words. Martin often hand feeds sick or injured wild birds, nursing them back to health. But sometimes his care is not enough. Those times when I do have to euthanize an eagle, um, you know, it just, it really tears me up because, you know, I've dedicated my whole life to rescuing them. And so quite often I have to just uh, grab Scout and we'll just sit, sit out in a shady spot and, and we'll talk. Yeah, we'll get our feelings out. And, and to be honest with you guys, he doesn't care. You know, it, it heals me, he doesn't understand, but it, it, it allows me to, to vent and to feel better. Yeah, he's such a good boy.
It could be easy to leave the story of Martin and his birds here, but there's much more to this man than just his love of birds. As we drive out to a remote desert area with a rehabilitated hawk in the back of his car, Martin is at his happiest. This is why he does what he does. The thrill of releasing a bird back into the wild is something he has experienced many times, and he passes this joy on to visitors and bird lovers whenever he can. The Southwest Wildlife Foundation of Utah was started by Martin to assist in returning eagles and other birds of prey back into the wild after injuries sustained mainly by human intervention. Over 100 birds a year are rehabilitated and returned to the wild, an incredible statistic considering that the person responsible for helping these animals was not always a big fan of birds. Well, actually, as a child, I was terrified of them. My earliest childhood memory was uh, such a, a horrible fear of birds. I had uh, climbed up on the uh, kitchen table at my grandparents' house. They, my grandfather had a pet parakeet, and as a little tiny toddler, I decided I'd pet the, the pretty green little bird in the cage. I stuck my hand in there and, and went to pet the bird, and the bird bit me. And I pulled away from the, the bird and, and, the, and me in the cage and everything fell off the table and, and smashed everywhere and, and it was traumatic and that caused me to, to have a, a tremendous fear. And it was getting worse and worse. Every time I'd see even a sparrow fly overhead, I'd scream run for the house. Keeping a few birds for education and friendship is important to Martin. But he sees what we are doing today as being far more beneficial especially after he has spent many weeks or months treating so many injured animals. But does he feel a loss when the birds just fly away? I get asked all the time from people, you know, you've put your heart and soul into rescuing these animals and they just fly away. Does that make you feel bad? And the truth of the matter is, no, that's, that is my reward. Like I said, we don't get paid for this. My reward is the knowledge that there's one more beautiful eagle, hawk, owl, whatever, back in the sky. There's one more beautiful deer, or coyote, or fox back in the wild. That's, that's my reward. It's always a really good day when I can turn something loose. Today, Martin has enrolled some help with the latest release. It's an emotional moment, and neither of the men know quite what to expect. You'll release the bird. You just follow my instructions and you'll be perfectly safe. And, and I'll take the bird out of its box. I will uh, hand the bird to you and I'll show you how to hold it properly. And then we'll just walk over to the rock fence right there and hold the bird for as, as long as you're comfortable. And then all, all I want you to do is take the bird and just throw it. Yeah. And, and it, should, uh, it should go. And you will be the last person on the planet to ever touch that beautiful hawk. Just hold it right into your chest, yeah. just, just like this. And then when you're ready to release her, then all you're going to do is just take her and just throw her right up in the air. Okay. So it's, it's very, very simple. Let me strike this. And I don't want you to release her with the hood on. That would no, be very no, bad. No, that's not good. Hey, sweetie, the baby girl. Yes, you are. Your baby girl. Such a sweetheart. Okay. Now I want you to put your hands underneath, your fingers underneath mine and grab those feet. Grab both of them. Yeah. Okay, you got those. And you've got a hawk in your arms, yeah. and you will be, like I said, if all goes well, you'll be the last person on the planet to ever touch that beautiful animal. Yeah, what a perfect yeah. Let's go over here. Martin is just as enthusiastic today releasing this bird as he has been for many years. And with the wind blowing, it's probably going to go that way. Any opportunity to escape? She'll take it, and she'll fight with you, and she'll and she'll try to escape. But right now, she doesn't think she has an option. Yeah, because you so, keep the pressure on there. Yes. I've probably got more pressure than you would ever have. <laughs> you ready, I guys? know it's a little intimidating, but there no, you go. No, it's not intimidating. It's just uh, interesting. Yeah, it's great. Whenever you're ready, guys. Yeah, and I'm yeah. ready on my end. Jules? Yeah. So I still hold the legs. Just, just move it away from your chest yeah. and throw it up and release the legs at the same time. Okay. Here we go. She's 
she's landed. Oh, almost, but she will land. Now, now she's going to, uh, well, maybe she'll catch a little ridge lift and, go, and continue going up. She's still going. Yeah, she's going to go up. She's catching some ridge lift over there. Wow. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. That's, that's a privilege. Yeah, that's what I do. I just yeah, care for man. critters and put them back in the wild. Thank you very much. Oh, you <laughs> yeah, it's an incredible experience. Yeah, amazing. I've never let anything go before. I tend to keep them and eat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like I said, I, that, this has been my entire life. Yeah. You know, my misguided life. This yeah. is what I do. <laughs> no, it's a great thing to do. Yeah, it's, I it's, think it's so. a great thing to do. No, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you're, so. you're welcome. Very Baby ferret can be like bringing home two toddlers. If you don't know what you're getting, you see this cute little animal. Our first one, we had to replace all the children's beds. We had to replace all the carpets in their bedrooms. No, I didn't know anything. Um, I'd be cleaning my teeth and she'd be climbing up and eating the soap. You need to know what you're doing before you do it or it's dangerous. You look at those teeth. Look at ferrets' teeth. They're, they're designed to chew and to crush, crush bones. I tell everybody ferrets bite. Domesticated from the European polecat, the ferrets' fluffy appearance and playful nature make it seem an unlikely predator. Yet ferrets are such adept predators that they have been used for centuries to hunt rabbits. This is what they used back in uh... Uh, the Dark Ages and back in the 1700s, 1800s, these, are, these things hunted rabbits for wealthy people. But these were bred in captivity in Europe hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The ferrets are taken and, and put down the holes and they chase the rabbits out. They put nets across the, across the holes so that the rabbits just go straight up into the nets. And that was why ferrets were first brought to Australia. They come out with their um, settlers they were also popular for pest control in cities, flushing out and killing rats, and even helping with rat bolting, a method used to chase wires through buildings. Ferrets are still used for rabbit hunting today, although they are far more commonly seen as house pets. Joe is the rescue coordinator for the Western Australian Ferret Society. She currently cares for 17 ferrets many of whom can't be rehomed. This is Gator. Gator will not use his back legs. He eats, drinks, he's happy. But yeah, most of these are all rescues for one reason or another. We get quite a few each year. There are a lot of reasons why people surrender them. They're not prepared is one of the big ones. This is a little rescue girl. We knew where her owners were, but they never came forward to claim them. So she stays. Ferrets are small and mostly domesticated, and many, like Joe, see them as an attractive and rewarding pet, despite their bite. They're great. They're, they're a combination between a cat and a dog. They've got the curiosity of a cat, and that's what gets them in trouble. There's always what's over there or what's, you know, what's this or what's that, and, and they're too busy looking at everything. You know, everything is fast forward for a ferret. But they've got the loyalty, the love, the intelligence of a dog. It's like it's all rolled into this tiny little furball. Ferrets are best known for their bad smell and their bad bite. And at first, even Joe wasn't keen on the idea of a ferret as a pet. A friend of our daughter, my youngest daughter, who was, I think even when she was five, she wanted a ferret. You weren't gonna have one. I used to think that they were the worst creature ever put on the earth. And um, a friend purchased her one. 
and we hit the roof. There was no way in the world my husband and I were going to have a stinky hot throat in my house. Um, and then we, they brought her home and put her in my hands, and it was instant love. I just fell in love with her. In Las Vegas, Exotic Pets employee Georgia is another fan of the ferret. She has nine of them herself. Essentially, they're kind of like a puppy or a kitten, and they never really grow up in the fact that they're always playful. They love to, like, have attention and just interact. Um, they're pretty easy to take care of, and they're really fun and interactive. I mean, they're sleepy right now, but you can wrestle with them, you can play with them, and they're more than happy to play back. And I just, they're really interactive. Their boisterous nature means that ferrets can be quite a handful. Joe has fostered dozens over the years, and it's taken all of those years of experience to get the hang of keeping them as pets. Toilet seats, you know, it's toilet doors. People leave seats up and doors open. It's just something a lot of places do. You need to put the seat down and close the door because the little buggers will get in it because of their curiosity, what's in there. But yeah, they'll climb, they'll climb brick walls. In the US, ferrets are such a popular pet. They're the biggest seller in Ken Foose's exotic pet store in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is the number one city that sells ferrets in the world. Reno is number two. Why? Because 99.9% .9 of our ferrets go to California because they're illegal in California. 99% of the ferrets in Reno go to California. They take care of the Bay Area. We take care of San Diego and, and Los Angeles. If ferrets are illegal to own in California. I don't ask them where they live. California has banned the keeping of pet ferrets, fearing that if released into the wild, they will decimate the local flora and fauna, as they did in New Zealand, where the fuzzy predators are also prohibited. When someone comes in and buys a ferret, they pick it up, we give it to them in a box, they walk out the door with it. They're the ones crossing the state line with a banned animal, not me. And um, I think in all the years, I think we've had one person that got caught at the state line with one. And, uh, and we, we sell hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ferrets. And we get that a lot where they'll say, hey, we want to buy a ferret. We live in Fresno. Will you ship us a ferret? And I said, absolutely not. Hey, you want a ferret? Drive down here and get it. And, uh, and they do. Members of the weasel family, ferrets are obligate carnivores and in the wild will feed on small mammals and birds. In captivity, they still need to be fed a meat-only diet. I always tell people, think of a T-Rex in a little version. So it's, it's raw meat, um, day-old chickens, mice. Yeah, my guys have the raw meat and the chicken hearts and chicken giblets, and they like them. They need to chew. And it turns out that if ferrets aren't properly fed, they may look for an alternative and very vulnerable food source. In 2011, a four-month-old baby boy from Grain Valley, Missouri, was left in critical condition after a hungry pet ferret ate seven of his fingers. His parents were charged with criminal neglect. A one-month-old baby girl left unattended downstairs in her Pennsylvania home in 2015 had her nose, upper lip, and cheek eaten by the family's three pet ferrets. And in Lancashire, England, a 10-month-old baby girl needed hospital treatment after she was savaged in her pram by a ferret. Having looked after hundreds of ferrets over the years, Joe maintains that their biting is rarely aggressive. They'll bite when they're frightened. They bite to protect themselves. But they'll also bite to play. One of their favorite games is tag chasey. But they can only tag you with their teeth. That's, it's a form of communication for them. Um, I mean, look, there's 17 ferrets in this house at the moment and there's not a mark on me. They'll come up to you and they'll use their teeth and they'll just go like that. But some people, they don't know it. They've never seen it before. They think they're attacking it. The minute they use their teeth, they're biting them. But generally, they'll only bite because they're frightened. That's it. And once you know how to handle that, 
you're fine. Again, that's being prepared. See? Not a mark. So he's playing with me, but he uses his teeth. So, but for some people, that's enough to, to say they've been bitten. But it, it, it's not. It's a way that he's communicating with me. Like our producer, Joe has also experienced the ferret that bites and won't ow, let ow, go. Ow, ow. You can get out of Ow, ow, ow. 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 Ow, ow, ow
Her passions quickly extended beyond zebras, and her property in Texas is now home to a successful rescue and breeding program and houses over 45 zebras, as well as herds of water buffaloes, camels, deer, goats, and horses. I love my zebras. I will be the crazy zebra lady. I already am, but I'm gonna be the really good one when I'm older. There are certain types of zebras. There's actually a mountain zebra, there's a Grevy zebra, a Grant zebra, and a Chapman, Damara type zebra. We have all the types here, so it's pretty unique to get to interact with them and see the personality differences, because they are different. No two zebras have the same stripes. In fact, their stripes are just like human fingerprints, unique to each animal. Each zebra has different characteristics. The Grevy zebra is known for the large ears. He looks like Mickey Mouse. And they have a white stomach, and their stripes are vertical, and they have a white belly. And then we have the mountain zebra, which looks somewhat like a pony that has a medium-sized ear and really fat, beautiful stripes on the rump. It kind of does a zigzag pattern, and it does also have a white stomach. The Grant zebra has full belly stripes and they're thicker and they do go vertically and horizontally. I mean, they're a smaller type zebra. And then the Damara type Chapman zebra actually has zebra stripes on its body and they typically have white legs, no stripes. So you can definitely, if you point all of them out and stand them together, you can, there's obvious differences, you can tell. Two of the species of zebra that Dominic houses are endangered, the mountain zebra and the Grevy zebra. Due to their need to compete with livestock for food, the destruction of their habitat for farmland, and hunting, mountain zebra populations have previously reached as low as 750 individuals worldwide. Fortunately, current numbers are back up to around 2,000, and part of Dominique's work involves breeding these animals in the hope of keeping the population growing. In addition to breeding these highly sought after creatures, Dominique sells her much cared for charges to other exotic animal owners who are looking to expand their own herds after a thorough screening process, of course. It's amazing. The relationship you can have with the zebra is one in a million. You know, it's a very hard process to screen potential owners. I feel that people that go into exotic animal ownership you really have to be passionate. And I can tell that in someone's voice when they call. It's the people that want to ride them or go in parades and do things. It's like you set yourself up and the animal for failure. So I try to screen all the clients and really talk to them and tell them what they're getting into. And if the, at the end of the day, you're satisfied looking out in your beautiful pasture with two beautiful zebras grazing on the grass, you will never have an unhappy day with a zebra. You will love that animal. And I invite everybody out here to come see and, and really know if this is an animal that they want to get into. You know, you need to think about vet work and what if something happens, what are you going to do? You know, you have to have those plans and stuff. I do not want to get my zebras back. I want them, when they leave this property, I've raised them. I want them in a forever home. It's not just humans that need screening when it comes to the sale of Dominic zebras. Zebras are wild creatures, and attacks on humans when they get too close aren't uncommon. With owning zebras, there is an element of danger. Uh, you always really do have to be careful. When I first started getting into zebras, I was very ignorant. I ended up in possession of a zebra that was very dangerous three-year-old stallion, and he was represented to me as the best zebra in the world. It even said that on the ad. And I had the animal at my house for less than 10 hours, and that zebra viciously attacked me. He bit me in the neck. He took some neck muscles off. I was in the emergency room, and it was quite an ordeal. Zebras defend themselves by rearing, biting, and kicking. In the wild, they have even killed lions often by breaking their jaws so they starve to death. I've been kicked by camels, zebras, horses, <laughs> anything you can imagine. I've gotten kicked and uh, that bite sure gets you. That, that bite will do it. But to this day, it was the best experience that's ever happened to me. 
thank God for my life and everything's fine, but I learned so much from that day. I learned that you really have to respect these animals and it can happen at any minute. And I think education is very important. You really need to be aware of what's going on and it goes back to not having unrealistic expectations. If you plan on loving that animal and not interacting with it and having it graze in a pasture, you're gonna be fine. When we try to move the animals or doctor them, do any vet work, that's where you have to be really careful. And breeding and raising for temperament is huge. The foundation, how the zebra was raised, where it was raised, that's all a big deal. It's kind of like children. There's different ways to raise kids. There's different ways to raise zebras. And I believe that there's good ways and bad ways. And each one has an effect on the adulthood of the animal. I have guys that raise tigers and carnivores and they won't mess with a zebra. <laughs> so they're pretty tough animals, but as long as you get around them and you, you know how to work with them, it's fun. It's really fun. I enjoy it. I wouldn't give it up for anything. Unlike horses and donkeys, zebras have not been fully domesticated by humans. They remain predominantly wild. Dominic's Safe Haven Rehabilitation Program rescues zebras, and they are certainly at home on the ranch. It started out with the zebras, and it slowly trickled into camels and a few different things. And now that I've had water buffalo, I am hooked on them. They're amazing. They're such a neat animal. Dominic's property is prone to flooding, so conditions here are not suited to typical livestock varieties. Water buffalo, on the other hand, thrive on the damp, marshy ground. There are several different types of water buffalo, and all are very hardy animals. The Cape water buffalo is the most dangerous variety, responsible for more deaths than any other. I have some cows I won't go in with, I have some that I can scratch on the stomach and they'll lay down like a dog. Dominic's property is well secured, not just to ensure the safety of the animals inside the fences. The fencing that I prefer to keep, the big herd of water buffalo in, is eight foot tight lock fencing. It is good for the animals inside the fence and it's good for the animals on the outside. The fencing that we have doesn't allow predators to come in and eat the calves and then it also doesn't allow the animals that are on the inside to jump over or get through it. You know dogs can't come in, the calves can't slide out, so it's extremely safe. It's been the best thing that I've found for any exotic. Water buffalo in the U.S. are mostly crossbred for a variety of characteristics. I do like to focus on a big horn base and I want the horns to kind of come back instead of curl. And so we can breed for those characteristics, but they do have giant horns. Some are better than others. Like domestic cattle, some have big horns and some don't, but I do like the big wide ones. Those are my favorite. In the wild, those giant horns are used to establish dominance and defend themselves from predators. In captivity, they ensure the water buffalo remains an outside pet. I would never have any of those in my house. They have been in my house, <laughs> all of them. It's really fun, you know, when you're like, hey, walk around the corner, you have a water buffalo following you or a zebra. I mean, you know, it's fun to stand out. <laughs> and I've taken these animals, surprisingly, I've actually used them all on set. So. I've done a few things in the entertainment industry, and I've had zebras in elevators, I've had water buffalo on stage. I mean, the things that we've done with animals are pretty impressive. <laughs> I think anything can be done with patience. In keeping with her obsession for four-legged creatures, Dominic has most recently expanded her herd to include camels. Camels are interesting. I have owned up to 20 of them at a time. I have had Bactrians and I've had dromedaries. A Bactrian is a two humped camel and a dromedary, which is the most common, has one hump. And we've used those in the entertainment industry. They're very hardy, 
easy to keep, very sweet, good animals. Really, really neat. Compared to our zebras, camels are very easygoing and easily trained. They're very emotional animals, so they're the type that you want to ask, which you should do with everything, but you ask them, you can bribe them, and you can typically get whatever you need done accomplished. Their large size can make camels dangerous, but Dominique is more concerned about their lack of manners. Camels do spit. It's a learned behavior, so they don't typically just spit on you. But in my experience, as long as I don't have one that spits, none of mine spit. But if you get one that starts it, five will follow. They do bite. Camels are very, very notorious for biting. If you go overseas, you'll see a lot of them with a little nose mask, kind of a guard. I've seen some pretty good camel bites. But for the most part, it's like anything. If, you're, if you work with them and not against them, you have a great relationship with any animal. It's when you kind of get into the training techniques and when you butt heads is when you might have a problem, but there's some great trainers in the U.S. Train them as she might, Dominique has still fallen foul of their vicious kicks. I've been, I would call it a camel hoof. I've been hoofed by a camel before. <laughs> I've been camel hoofed. And it's like a frontward kick instead of a backwards kick. They take their front foot and they just whack you with it. If you're gonna get into exotics, camels would be one of the good ones to start with, and they would be get a gelding or a female. A gelding would be a castrated male. Get something young. I don't recommend bottle babies, but if you get with the right breeder and the right people, you'll have a great animal. Good pet, really good pet. They may be her pets, but Dominic's herds still work for their keep, and they often hit the road in the back of the trailer to take part in events or to be used as therapy animals. I think that any animal likes to have a job, whether it's being ridden or interacted with in therapy sessions, anything like that. I think animals do like to have a job and a purpose. As long as it's kind and the animals are willing, they actually look forward to doing stuff. I, I've done a few events and my trailer will pull up to the barn and I've got four animals waiting to go on the trailer because they know we're going somewhere. So it's typically like your dog, if you take your dog in the car and you go for rides, that dog can't wait to get in the car. Doesn't know what it's doing, but it likes to go and do something. So I think the animals we have like to be a part of something, whether it's being ridden commercially or privately, I think they like to have a purpose. I like to educate people. There's nothing better than seeing somebody's dream come to life when they actually touch and interact with that animal. All of my animals here are gentle. We really focus on making everything friendly and happy and a really good environment for people and the animals. And when that kid has read about a black and white striped horse in a book, and they actually get to interact and touch and feel the difference between a zebra and a horse or a goat, that's what's gonna help our animals is getting the kids to learn about conservation and you know, slowly repopulating, but making sure that our animals don't leave.